I am really enjoying this new series, Meant for Good. Uh, the story of Joseph, as recorded in the book of Genesis, has always been one that stood out to me. There's, it's so rich. There's so much content there for us. And uh, this past Sunday, uh, if you haven't caught it, it was the fourth Sunday of the series. Pastor Ed Glover of Urban Impact Foundation broke down Chapter 41. Phenomenal message. I'd encourage you to go back and watch the messages if you haven't done it. I want to go back to Genesis 41 because there is a problem introduced in the narrative of Joseph. And that problem is famine. I want to look at famine a little bit because I think there's some observations about famine that absolutely speak to us and our present condition here in the world in America. So the first observation that I have for you, I wrote this down. Uh, the famine in Genesis is a problem for which no one is responsible. I mean, think about that. Who's responsible for the famine that was going to take place in Egypt? I mean, was it the enemies of Egypt who brought this famine? No, it, it was something that was all people were going to be affected by this in the ancient world. Was, was, the, was the famine uh, a responsibility? Was it, was it a product of the government? Did the government bring about the famine? No. In fact, we could see in Genesis 41, let me take you there, verses 28 to 32. We have some commentary about the origin of the famine. Joseph says this, he says, It is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten, and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered, because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God, and God will do it soon. I mean, think about the coronavirus. Who's responsible for it? There's a lot of finger pointing going on. But is anyone really sure where the virus comes from? I mean, ultimately, we could say this. Whether God's judging us, and there's conversation about that, God is punishing us, people talk about that. No matter what, God is going to use this. Because God, as we're talking about, and we read in the Scriptures, does work all things together for the good of those who love Him. All things. And so who's responsible? We see that observation in the, in the, in the uh, description of the famine in Genesis 41. There's a second observation that the famine brings to us, and that's this, is that the problem overrides the Egyptian empire. The, see, Pharaoh turns to the wise men. Can the wise men help with the famine? They don't even know what these dreams are about. Do the politicians of the day in Egypt have an answer? to the famine that's forthcoming. They don't. In fact, we see in Genesis 41 again, verse 8, it says this, In the morning, his mind, Pharaoh's mind, was troubled. So he sent for all his magicians and wise men, and Pharaoh told them his dreams, but no one, no one, no one could interpret them for him. No one had an answer for what was forthcoming. Do you feel this way about what's going on with the coronavirus? that no one has an answer? Do you feel the same way? It seems like it. In fact, it seems like there's a lot of confusion. And people are pointing the fingers at one another that you should be doing more and you should have an answer for this. And, and why haven't you done something about this? No one seems to really have an answer. It probably explains a lot of the confusion that we're facing in these days. So absolutely, once again, we see that the scriptures are so relevant to our times. Though ancient in nature, we see that God is speaking to us through these scriptures for our present time. And, and here is the point, I believe, it speaks to the future. You see, in, in Genesis 41, the future was going to be wrought in the midst of a famine. If there was going to be a future, it was going to be worked out in the context of a coming famine. A famine that wasn't going to be stopped, that was going to come to the land. You see this in Genesis 41:33. Joseph has an answer for what the Pharaoh should do in the midst of the famine. Here's what he says. 
He says, Now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. You see, Joseph identified that the Egyptian empire didn't have an answer for this. Joseph identified that indeed they don't know who was responsible for it. They didn't have an answer for what was going to happen. And so he says, listen, you need to find a person. You need to find wisdom, a way that this can be addressed. I would suggest this. In our times, if the coronavirus is indeed uh, something that's affecting humanity, of course, it is, that the church of Jesus Christ is the answer for the world today. I believe that the church should be the institution. The church should be the place where the world is looking to for wisdom. You know, you might say, well, well how is that? Well, listen, people more than ever are feeling like they need hope. Well, where, where does real hope come from? Real hope comes from the gospel. Real hope comes from knowing Jesus Christ, He who's overcome even death, He who holds the future in His hands, He who, who sits on the throne of eternity. Jesus is the one who is the source of ultimate hope. And because He is the source of ultimate hope, and we are His people, we can know real hope, and the world can know real hope through the people of Jesus, His church. Here's the second thing. People are seeking for peace. People are, are, are wondering what's going to happen. They're anxious. They're losing sleep. They're self-medicating. Well, where does real peace come from? Once again, real peace comes from the gospel of Jesus. He is the prince of peace. He is the one who gives peace that passes all understanding. He is the one who brings a peace because He is the God of eternity. And so in the times that we're living in, the church, much like Joseph was to Egypt, can be a source of wisdom, can be a source of leadership in the culture. The church can point people to real hope. The church can point people to real peace. Now you may hear me say this, you think, oh boy, he, he's really talking pie in the sky here. He's, he's, really, he's really naive to think that people are going to listen to the church. Well, listen, our God is a God of inversions. You know what I mean? I mean, our God is the one who said, yeah, Egypt, the world power, you are going to be subject to Israel, unknown Israel. I mean, shouldn't it be the reverse that Egypt, the powerhouse of the world, in the book of Genesis, in those times, would be the one who's dictating to Israel? Wouldn't Israel be dependent on Egypt? But it's the other way around. God has a way of confounding power. God has a way of working these inversions. I'll show you a few examples from the New Testament. Matthew 9.30, familiar words from Jesus. Jesus says, Many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. There's this inversion principle inherent and the kingdom of God. Or how about this? 2 Corinthians 12. But he said to me, this is Paul writing, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in what? Weakness. My power is made perfect in weakness and inversion. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, and in insults, and in hardships, and persecutions, and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. God loves, He delights in inversions. He loves to take the weak, the ones who are overlooked, the ones who are despised, and to bring about His strength and His power manifest in them. This is a time for the church. And so I'll repeat to you what I said a few weeks ago, if you caught it, in one of these devotions. In the book of Isaiah, God searching said, Who will I send? And Isaiah stands up and says, Here I am, Lord, send me. I believe that we as a church are people who need to put our yes on the table, so to speak, and say, Here we are, Lord, send us. We will be your voice. We will share with people the real hope and the real peace 
of Jesus Christ. When there are no answers, when people are, are groping about, trying to figure out what to do next, when people can't figure out where things are coming from, we, the church, will say, yes, Lord, here we are. Send us. Church, let's be those people. Let's be a people who through faith say, Lord, for such a time as this, we will stand up and say, our yes is on the table. Here we are. Send us. We want to share with people the hope of Jesus Christ. We love you so much. Grateful for all of you. Praying for you daily. Can't wait to meet again. Hopefully that time is coming again soon. And we are going to stand fast in faith and look to how the church can truly show that we are the people of Jesus and Jesus is the hope for the world today. Amen.